Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Today I have a dynamic guest for you. I am so excited to bring you somebody from across the waves. Yes, with me today I have a Belgian, French, Italian character, actor, entertainer. And this is going to be a fun show. I am delighted because he was born in Belgium from Sicilian parents. And well, I happen to like that because, well, I'm a little Sicilian myself. And so with me, my guest today, his father happened to be an opera singer. And who doesn't want to follow in their parents' footsteps, right? I know that this is something that most of us want to do. But in his home, it was all about music. So naturally, my guest decided that he would like to build his dream in the music and entertainment industry. And so what he did was set off to do so. And so in about the fall of 2014, my guest moved to London and even appeared, well, in one of the X Factor episodes. And well, while this was a little bit of uh, a little challenge, well, he received some praise from Simon Cowell. Yes, we all know who that is. And he said, you're a real entertainer. And this is so inspiring when we get something like that from someone who is known to be an honest critic. And so what an inspiration. He said, Simon Cowell said, don't give up. And that is exactly what my guest today did. He did not give up. He went on to move in attending um, an actor showcase, singing La Vie in, in roles and out of the blue, he was offered representation. And you know, it's really amazing because many people are hoping that they're discovered. And this is something so exciting. So off he goes. He appears in an auto trader commercial, driving characters on Dave. He ends up the stylish White Fog e-cigarette commercial and in Amazon's Prime, Prime featured Raymond's Five. With me, my guest will be in, um, a, a goblin in Dizzy's Artemis Fowl. This is being directed by British actor-director Sir Kenneth Branagh. And my guest speaks French, Italian, English, and he lives in London. This is so incredible. And recently, he came to the United States. He went and checked out Hollywood. And while he was there, he met a number of professionals in the entertainment industry. And they have suggested that he moves here. And I'll tell you what, I've given him a few suggestions on my own off air, but we're going to let you hear some of the things that he's doing and the opportunities that has been presented to him along the way. But you're going to fall in love with him. His energy, his entertainment value that he has just within himself that comes out. And I've got to tell you, he's got a dream and he's going to share it with you. Today, my guest is Giuseppe Lentini. Welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. Hello, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be there with you and your audience. It's amazing. Well, you are coming in from all across the waves from the other side of the world, and here you are. I've got to tell you, the time zone different difference is here in between where we're at, and I want to appreci appreciate you by sharing with you that um, I know how much your day has been packed with things that you've had to do. And I want to thank you so much for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm more, more than welcome. I'm really pleased to be there with you. So we know a little bit about your background, Giuseppe. Tell me what kinds of things, what is your genre, your favorite genre to sing? To sing the thing, you know, as I say, my dad was an opera singer from a very young age. Uh, himself started like he was only seven years old when his parents discovered that he had something quite special in his voice and so then he got like a bit of training and singing teacher and so on so when we were young kids ourselves at home my dad always was singing always always either he was rehearsing either he was even teaching my eldest brothers and sisters like you know and and i remember 
coming down, you know, through the doors like this. And I was like maybe four or five. And I said, I want to learn. I want to learn. And he said, you're too young. Your turn will come. And then eventually it didn't happen. But anyway, <laughs> at home, really, my dad, my dad loved all kinds of music. Not only did he like opera, but he did like pop music and, you know, was a real fan of um, the early years of Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston and Maria Carey and Prince. And, you know, he was so in the thing, you know, like we were the kids and he was like the one after all this. And he was really like amazed by all the talents that uh, you guys had in America. And so, I mean, my childhood was really like, you know, French influence, obviously, because, you know, in Belgium, yeah. we all basically from a very young age on the cable, you know, on the TV networks, you are in Belgium. We used to have like all the TV networks from Europe available on TV. So, you know, you'd, you switch our channel and you hear all those different languages like coming from everywhere in Europe. And obviously from, uh, Belgium has a very, very strong link with France, as you can imagine. Yes, yes. We share the same language. So, so we watch a lot of the French TV because that's, we understand that language. And um, so we, we were raised also with, uh, you know, all the Chanson Francaise kind of uh, people like Edith Piaf, which is, I love Edith Piaf myself. Uh, Jacques Brel who was like French, French also uh, singer, but basically well, he was Belgian, you know. Ne me quitte pas, you know. Oh. He's Belgian. He made an amazing career in, um, in uh, France, and I know he even made it to America at some point, but he was actually Belgian. Some people don't always know that. Interesting, but okay. So, and, uh, so I was really influenced by French culture, Italian culture, because my parents were Italian, you know, uh -huh. Italian. And somehow then I was also going to school in the French language, you know, Belgium. I was living in Wallonia, which is, was the French speaking part of Belgium. And so I was raised in the French language and studied in French and so on. Then maybe when I was in my early twenties, I moved to Brussels and uh, start meeting other people, you know, and start meeting um, music, people in music business and so on. And I was even offered, I remember, like around 16 years old, um, a kind of a song by Sony Music, which was quite a big label, you know, still is today, you know. And, but I thought that the lyrics were so like silly. I didn't feel like singing that song at all. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, you know, I kind of turned it down, you know, I thought to myself how, you know, I know everything and I'm 16 and I know, you know, I'm going to be a superstar and yes. I don't need that, you know, we can be naive sometimes. But anyway, so anyway, maybe it was just not meant for me. And um, so, but somehow I, I wrote my first ever song then, I was 16 and the song was called Believe in Yourself. That was a kind of a ballad, uh, inspirational ballad about... I think it was like somehow talking about my journey already because by the age of 16, I think, I had already kind of experienced a lot of, uh, a lot of maybe difficult things, I would say. So okay. I kind of built myself a, a character. I had kind of a strong character by, from a very young age, I think. And so I thought I wanted to, I was kind of singing that song to myself, basically, I think, because um, I wanted to make sure that... Uh, I'd keep the motivation and the drive and the will to just keep on, you know, trying. And, and I've been doing it ever since. And sometimes people say, my God, why aren't you just giving up? I said, because I'm not the kind of person to give up. I like to stick there. And um, I know there's something for me out there. And um, I just keep on and keep on. And I know that at the end of the day, when you, are, when you have a dream, everyone in life, we might all have a dream in different area of life. But I believe at the end of the day, if you're a dreamer and you obviously work towards your dream and you try to do everything right towards your dream, because you can't just stay there sitting in your chair and say, oh, I have a dream. You know, obviously you have to put some efforts into it. And, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's always what I've been trying and doing. And then I believe, so I say, if you stick to it, and if you don't give up, if you believe in yourself, then one day someone will believe in you. Because I, I think if you want someone to trust you and give you an opportunity, they have to feel that really within yourself, you have that, that drive and you have that motivation and you have that, 
you know you really want to to do it you want to you want to convince everyone you can do it and i always say success comes with opportunity so that's what i'm waiting for opportunities like you know <laughs> well, i i absolutely love this because what you've said is so important and that's never give up and oftentimes we are on the brink of something and we throw in the towel way too early. Now, one of the things I'm wondering is, can you tell me about your time on the X Factor? Yes, yes. It was, it was quite, um, when I moved to London, I thought that was a, I met a couple of producers and writing a bit of songs here and then recording a bit. And then one day I saw the, the advert, you know, the advertisement on TV, like, oh, X Factor, blah, blah. So I thought, oh, well. Why not? You know, they'll have a first French Italian on the on the on the show because pretty much they always have like British proper British speaking people. So I thought that'd be a bit kind of uh, exotic to have someone a bit you know different. And indeed, I think they were they were drawn to that kind of difference. And and so I went through quite a couple of auditions because you know there's a something like four or five auditions through the process. You know. You're meeting like with, at the time it was like Sony Music, I think, that was producing the, the show. So you're meeting the okay. people from, you're meeting the executive from Sony Music, you're meeting the producers from the TV network, you're meeting uh, some judges and some people who analyze everything and, you know. So anyway, I went through all the phases of uh, auditions and then comes day one and the show, show day. And I had chosen a song from, like, sorry, for the, I'm talking about a lot of Michael Jackson right now, but, and I had chosen a song from him, The Way You Make Me Feel. And you know, it was quite a jazzy version. The way you make me feel, you never turn me on, you gather up my feet. You know, so it was a bit kind of a jazzy, and I was doing a bit dance, little dance routine with it and so on. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, it was like such a, an incredible coincidence, but the day of my, the show day, when I was meant to, to have my, my moment, the same very morning, Michael Jackson died. That was, the, that was the exact day when he passed in the morning, when I was on the show. Oh. Um. So eventually, you know, obviously, having chosen a Michael Jackson song on the day of his passing was not really a good idea. But, uh, but unfortunately, uh, I couldn't change because I had gone through all the audition process with that song, so they thought I had to, to keep sure. that song. But you know what I mean? Because everyone was about, oh my God, Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson, you know, so it's like I would have had like, even if I had done like my super, super best, I mean, because it was such a unfortunate kind of timing, um, then I think that was it. You know, Michael Jackson was the king of pop, and yes, was... yes. And, and then eventually, so they asked me eventually. They asked me to song to sing another song, which I did, which was um, George Michael, Faith. Yes. And as you can see now, at 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 this day, both of these amazing artists obviously are on the other side. So it was kind of a, a coincidence as well back then. But anyway, so they say, oh my God, you have, a, you have like this entertainment and all those moves and you're really into it and the thing. But, you know, as I say, my, uh, Simon Carroll thought that, he thought I had something special and he say, that's what I, he say, you have this, you're an entertainer. You're really an entertainer. And he say, don't give up. You know, something will come along and something will, he say, you might not fit for this format just now, but he say, if I had another type of format of show, I would definitely want you in. That's exactly uh, his words, you know. Uh -huh. So I thought, coming from him, as you know, I thought like that was an amazing uh, compliment. And I thought, okay, it didn't work for this, but you know, he told me, you know, there's something with you and just don't give up. And that's really shortly afterwards that I attended that uh, acting showcase, singing uh -huh. a song, you know, because they asked me to sing a song so there were like, I think, 10 or 12 actors, you know, doing a showcase. And um, one of the actresses in a scene needed someone to sing in French. So I offered to sing La Vie en Rose. And um, 
So and she was like sitting, uh, you know, it was like this cabaret kind of chair, dark chair. And she was sitting there dressed all in black and having this monologue and was quite really dramatic. And, uh, and then I come out of the blue in the lights and start singing that song and turning around her. And then, uh, and, and she was like overwhelmed and all the time. Oh yes, in heaven and oh. oh and it was beautiful. Yes, yes. It was sort of a really lovely moment. And um, I thought I'd do a little bit for you then, maybe. Yes. Quand il me prend dans ses bras, il me parle tout bas, je vois la vie en rose. Il me dit des mots d'amour, des mots de tous les jours, et ça me fait quelque chose. Il est entré dans mon cœur comme une part de bonheur dont je connais la cause. Il me l'a dit, l'a juré dans la vie. C'est lui pour moi, moi pour lui, pour la vie. Dès que je l'aperçois, alors je sens en moi mon cœur qui bat. Oh, that's breathtaking. <laughs> oh, the Giuseppe, you're going to have all the ladies just. Oh. Just a bit of France in America. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, that in itself. Yeah, so that was it. So that was quite really emotional. And I think that was then I think, I think an, an agent who was present there that night contacted me and say, I would love I would love to work with you. And I kind of start laughing a bit because I say, you know, I like singing, I'm I'm a singer, but I don't think I don't I'm not an actor, you know, I, I didn't train uh, well you say you're just a natural. I saw you on that stage and you're just a natural. You have it in you. You know, and I, I start kind of, a, I went back home, you know, had a chat with my flatmate and I said, you know, someone asked me to, to come for an interview uh, to work for an acting agency. And I say, well, and my friends say, you know, you got nothing to lose. Just go, do it. So I did. And then um, I attended the, the meeting two weeks later. Um, I did my monologue, you know, I, I picked up a monologue online, did that and then he said, well, good. And then he said, can you sing a bit in French? And I said, yes. Can you sing a bit in Italian? I said, yes. So I did a bit of both. And, uh, and I sang a little bit of La Donna Mobile from Pavarotti. And so the guy basically got up from his chair and he said, how the hell, that were exactly his words, <laughs> uh -huh. how, the hell, how the hell this huge voice can come out of this little body? <laughs> and then he said, welcome to the family. And that was it. The rest is... No history. kidding. <laughs> no that's, kidding. How my, that's how my acting career started. <laughs> okay. So since then, you've done commercials and you've been doing some other yeah, things. Short, yeah, short films, you know, like TV commercials, uh, voiceovers. And um, then also I do like, you know, one of my agents, she's called... Uh, because I have to remind that to your audience, maybe. I'm quite concentrate, you know. <laughs> I'm, yes. four, I'm four foot eleven, so it's like one hundred and fifty centimeters and a half. <laughs> I insist. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So and also, you know, for the casting directors, it's a bit confusing because I look Sicilian quite a bit, and uh, but as soon as I start speaking, I sound French. Whatever language I speak, I have this little French touch in it, so. You know, if I speak Italian, I sound a bit French. If I speak English, I sound a bit French. So, but anyway, so then I decided to, to no, I mean, I, I had another agent actually got in touch with me as well. And okay. that was called, uh, the agency is called Oh So Small. What? You know? Okay. Because, 
this lady is, a, is herself the, the manager of this uh, agency, which is called Lisa Osmond. She's a really, really lovely lady. And um, herself, when her son and her daughter, who also are short people, they were dreaming of having a career in the entertainment business. But because, okay. because, there, was, because there was not so many opportunities for short people, this amazing mom, she decided to set up her own agency primarily to help a boy and a girl. Okay. And she said, you know what? I'm going to set up this agency and I'm going to focus on helping short people to get parts in films and, uh, and so on. <laughs> so they're doing like standing work, prosthetic work, double, and also actors as actors. When uh, the industry will be ready to have us as actors, not just uh -huh. like little puppets, you know, <laughs> just... <laughs> is it pretty lucrative then? Sorry? Is it pretty lucrative? Does it bring a lot of business to you through them? Well, as I, uh, you know, funny enough, as I say, because we are, you know, in, in a lot of films, every time you see like uh, children actors, you know? Yes. Kids actors. Um, Obviously, by law in this country, in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in America, but here in the United Kingdom, the children are not allowed to work more than a certain hours on a film right. set. So they have to have a minder and they also have to have like what they call a stand-in. So, which means I've done a bit of these jobs and on Pan, you know, on Peter Pan and on The Nutcracker and on some big movies. So you have a, a 12 years old kid there who needs someone to step in for them while they have like a pose. Because by law, they have to have this pose and study. So they have a mind and they go and study while I, as a short adult, take, it, take over. And so basically what we usually, usually do, uh, we, so we have two teams in film, in any big films. They're what they call the team A, which are actually the proper cast. The, all the actors and you know and then they have what they call the team B which are all the guys who are stepping in when the when the team A go on rest and go and learn their lines or whatever okay. and then we're preparing the team B sets we prepare all the scenes and all the sets of, you know the lighting and the positions and the props and everything okay so, so when it, everything is ready and perfect, then the team A come back and just shoot and do their things, you know? So I've done that a couple of times, yeah? I've done that kind of thing on, Pete, on Pan and Do Not Crack and other films. Oh, which are quite, goodness. So, which are quite really like big, big movies, you know, big Hollywood movies. Yes. And, uh, and um, but the aim, it's fantastic. It's great to be part of this such big movies and being around like these big actors and, you know, like Hugh Jackman and uh, dumb Judy Dench. And, you know, um, I've met like so many big actors and um, Tom Cruise I've met and, you know, but what would be amazing, obviously, is that I'm being appreciated for who I am for myself and I'm yeah. being given, uh, and I'm being given more opportunity to obviously have lines as an actor, as myself, not as a, someone else, you know? Well, you're a performer and an entertainer and you have experience yeah, and qualities exactly. and talents, yes. So I have this within me and I have, I have this to offer, I have so much to offer. I have, I have this energy within me. And um, I think that's what I've been trying to do like over the years, it's like, I'm trying as well, without any pretension. I'm trying to be, I always say I'm kind of a representative of the of another kind of diversity because you know in diversity is a big topic those days you know yes. so you have you know the lgbt and the transgender and you know you have like white people and colored people and gay straight or whatever you know so all of that is covered and it's fantastic and it's amazing that it's happening but there are so many like maybe I, I can include myself in it, that we are not enough represented yet in TV programs, in TV series, in, in, you know, in films, in big films and big movies. And, you know, so there are like millions of unrepresented people. Uh, if I give a couple of examples, you know, like people on, with disabilities, like people on a wheelchair, who are completely fine, who are completely amazing people, but I mean, the, 
you see sometimes one or, you know, once every moon we see one, but I mean, we could see more. And yeah. then, uh, you know, you have like people who are also small or also tall, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, people who are a bit like very skinny or quite, quite plain and rounded. And why not? And it's amazing to have all this variety of different characters and colors and colorful people. And, well, it's realism because when you take what's going on in the real world and show how true people can be and yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, they're like flowers. You, it's the beauty in all of the different... But what, but what's yeah. amazing is like, yeah, I, it's completely true. And, but what is it now? Is Hollywood ready to explore other area of what's happening or what's out there? You know, because you know, I know that when we go to the cinema, we want to dream. It's true. I think we all go to cinema to see it and see a movie. We want to escape our daily lives and and go to another world, uh, something that we think, you know, we want to explore and just let go of our problems and everything and get into the movie and dream, you know. But yes, somehow, yes. But somehow there are so many, so many amazing stories, untold stories out there from people who are slightly different, maybe. And True. They, have so many, they have so much to give and they have so much to tell the world. And I it's hope that and I hope that this will happen. There will be more and more people, opportunities given to people like me and all those people out there that may be listening. Um, I agree. Right? And, and that, then, it includes age and... Uh, also, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Age, exactly. All kind of, uh, you know, because, you know, it's a bit like, we know society, how society works. Like, you know, you look a certain way, you sound a certain way, you're coming from a certain place. So it's like society likes to put you in a box, you know. Yes. You're in that box and, and you're in that box and you're in that other box. But at the end of the day, you know, we all we all connect it and we 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 are all part of this amazing universe and this amazing amazing world. And how boring would that be if you would all be the same and all the same color and all the same heights and size and weight, you know? And I think all this diversity and all these colorful differences are just amazing. I agree you know. with you a hundred percent. Is there anything that you're currently working on or what have you got going on in, um, in the world of Giuseppe Lentini at the moment? Yes. So, um, at the moment we we have a project, even you, uh, we've done like this kind of a mobster series, which we are maybe thinking about doing a, a feature film about that one. So try to rework a bit the, the concept and, maybe turn into a, a feature film. Then I've actually written myself with a, a screenwriter. We've written a feature film screenplay. So which obviously I, I created a part for myself in it because, you know, help yourself and God will help. <laughs> You've got to do, you do this. I love this so far. You've got a lot going on. So maybe just the, the basic idea of this film, which is, would be called the, the, the title at the moment would be called like flashbacks because um, beside my actor's life journey and this journey I'm on, I'm also a carer, a PA, personal assistant and carer for wow. so, many, so many different people. So I look after children with uh, autism. I look after people with this, all kinds of disabilities. And um, so I'm helping them in their daily life, you know, like they want to go and buy books, if they want to go and see a play, if they want to go to cinema and see an opera, basically I arrange everything, I set up everything and, and here we go. And we go and, and do things. Oh, because, that you is know, beautiful. You wouldn't believe how so many people, and as you were saying as well, you know, in terms of age and culture, you know, all kinds of people who have so much to give still. But sometimes society, when, you are, when something happens, especially when you have like a, maybe a disability or, or something that is not quite working as it used to, I mean, we tend slowly, you know, the, the kind of a mainstream thing. It's like you're a bit on the side there, you know? And yes, what, what, I, yeah, yeah. what I wanted to do with that screenplay, with that movie, that I'm, I'm working on. But the screenplay is written. We still need to kind of adjust little bits and pieces. And, um, but the basic idea of this was like taking inspiration from my daily life, all those amazing people that I'm meeting every single day in my, 
in my job as a carer, as a PA. And uh, it's actually shedding some lights on those forgotten people. Because, you know, like, I have, a, for example, I'm looking after a 92 years old gentleman, and his, his wife was 102. You know, she was like 102 years old. And um, so they had an amazing story just themselves. Yes. I remember one day this gentleman told me, he said, don't you find that interesting that I'm 92 years old today, I've traveled the world, I've traveled everywhere in the world, I met thousands of people with my business, I shook, I shook thousands of hands and signed thousands of contracts. Today I'm 92 and I feel like I don't exist anymore. Oh, that is so sad. So that was his words. And he said, I've traveled the world. I've seen, the, you know, I've seen everything. He sounds so to me like you could write a screenplay called I've Traveled the World and then incorporate yeah. how he yeah. does feel like he even, you know, like he's invisible. This is yeah, horrible. Exactly. And so the point of that screenplay is, is to shed some light of do, all those forgotten, unrepresented people. But in a positive way, in a positive way, and a, in a comedy way as well, because I, we don't want people to yes. go to, to the theater well, and cry. You know, we want people to be feel uplifted. And, yes, and yes, yes, yes. I can completely understand that. But my point, when I shared that with you a second ago, was that, I mean, just on his life alone, you could do a screenplay. You could do this on... Yeah. So many exactly. different people. Exactly. And you know. How amazing is this what you're doing? I I am just you are dynamic in all of the things that you're doing. And to find that you're in a caregiver role behind the scenes is yeah, absolutely you know, it, amazing. It came, natu- it came naturally to me. Again, I don't know, I don't believe in coincidences. Yes. When eventually I had another agent, a like in 2012, I, for, from the very first agent I had from this showcase, uh, eventually after a couple of, a year or something, we kind of separate ways because um, I had a kind of full-time day job and, you know, you have to live. London is expensive, you know, you have to pay the bills. <laughs> so yeah. I, had to have, I was offered a full-time contract and I couldn't, I couldn't decline, I had to take it. So, I didn't have as much time anymore to attend casting and audition and so on. So obviously we separate ways because I didn't want to lose my agent's time and so on. But pretty much like four or five months after that, out of the blue again on LinkedIn, if I can cite this uh, social media network, you know, uh, I got a message from a, an actor. He was like in his 70s or something like that, a 70 plus uh, actor, really amazing guy. And he said, my agent, you know, he introduced me to his agent. She saw a couple of things on you on the internet and she would love to work with someone like you. So that was, again, another thing out of the blue. Yes. And this guy, which he was helping me because I felt I was quite new. So he was helping me with rehearsing. When I had a casting, he, he would play my, you know, my, he would play the part with me and he would give me so much advice, so many advice, you know, it was amazing. And then, maybe after a year, he got diagnosed himself, this lovely actor, with dementia. You know, oh. like when, uh, when you start having like memory troubles and things like that. So I started, att- he asked me naturally to help him, to support him in, in this journey. And I said, of course, I will, I will help you, you know. And I started attending meetings at the dementia center where he had to go and meet some specialists and... So I decided to attend with him the meetings. And so there was a group meeting with all patients who had dementia and, and their carer. And we were all chatting and exchanging memories. And so there was like to try to revive the memory and so on, you know? And that's how, again, maybe not so out of the blue that I got into the caring world through, through acting, through this actor. And then I thought, you know what? I moved to London. And I said, I came here because I'm an artist. I have this within me. I can't help it. And I cannot just work in an office nine to five. It's not for me. I've done it. Right. right. That's not for me. I'm dying. I'm dying in the office because I need to express myself. I need to be out there and, and be an artist. And um, 
So I resigned and I decided to set up my own little business as a, as a kind of a PA carer. And so I have private clients now and I have my, you know, I'm, I'm really helping uh, as many people as I can, but obviously, you know, and I, I just got a casting call today. So, and what is amazing, all my clients, when I, when I work with them, with all my, I don't like to call them patient. I call them clients because we are equal, you know? Yes. No matter, yes. No, matter what, no matter what the disabilities, the difficulties, I treat equal to equal. I never, never look at them, look down on someone and say, you know, oh, poor man. No, I don't. I don't like the, the pity kind of game. So I, I'm, I there to, I'm there to cheer them up, to inspire them, to give everything they have, and they still have a lot to give. So, and um, so what is amazing is all my, all my clients, they know exactly what I'm doing. They know I have this acting journey going on. And so I tell them straight, every time I meet a new client, I say, I'm an actor. I'm having a, this job on the side, alongside my acting uh, dream. And they're all okay. I say, you know, if, if it's okay for you, because sometimes I have to attend casting last minute. Sure. I may be, book, I may be booked for a job in, within 48 hours and I might need to leave and things like that. So as long as it's okay for you, we can work together. If it's not, then I'd rather be honest and, you know. Yes, yes, most, of course. Most people, most people are really excited about it and, they really like, it's like they're living this journey with me. They're like so excited for me. And so, and you know, they always ask me any news, any casting, any news from Hollywood. And you know, so, so they really like on this journey with me. And it's so amazing to have that support from all these amazing people I'm, I'm working with. And, and a lot of them become friends, really. They are family. They're no more clients. They, they're basically my, my family. Yeah. This is fantastic. I am so excited for you. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I've got to say, you have got an incredible website. You've got an incredible background. You are amazing at everything that you do. And I want to thank you for your time today. I know that, again, yes, yes. I know that the, it's late for you over there. And I appreciate you. I am just really I'm excited to see where you are going to take all of us with you on your journey in your career. And oh, so, we share that together. We share yes. that together. <laughs> so if you'll share with the viewers how they can connect with you and where they can um, see all of what you're doing. Yes. So uh, I have a, a personal website it's called GiuseppeLentini.com. So as you saw the, the spelling from Rebecca earlier, which was amazing. <laughs> then you can, I also have the Instagram, which I'm, I'm an Instagram guy. Yeah, I like Instagram. Uh, so it's Giuseppe Lentini underscore actor. But I mean, surely if you go on Google, because there's only one like me, <laughs> if you type Giuseppe Lentini, the, the short actor, you know, you'll see everything coming up there. So, you know. But uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Giuseppe Lentini as well. Uh, Twitter, Giuseppe Lentini. It's all, all on Giuseppe Lentini, the actor. Yeah. If you type the actor, everything comes up. Yeah. So, uh, and forgive me for this. You know, I'm, I like to chat online, and I like to to say I am there. You know, don't forget about don't forget about me. I'm here. I'm here to stay. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. This has been so fun with Giuseppe Lentini. And if you'll share this with your friends, your family, and all over social media, get his name out there. Check out his website, Giuseppe Lentini. Connect with him on Facebook, Instagram, and, in, and also on LinkedIn. 